Chapter 39, Hazardous Materials, Multiple Casualty Incidents, and Incident Management Systems. Before we get started, don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, check out Module 6 Supplemental Material. There will be several, several references to the material there in this discussion. So let's get started with Hazardous Materials, things that go bad and can harm so as we've talked about in the past, a hazardous material is any substance or material in a form that possesses an unreasonable risk to health, safety, or property when transported in commerce. That's a DOT definition. And as we pointed out, dihydrogen monoxide or water can be a hazardous material if in the right quantities. So as EMS providers, we're required to have various levels of training for hazardous materials. Most services require minimum of first responder awareness and first responder operations for all fro. You can also take it to the level of being a hazardous, hazardous material technician. This is a generalized training. Uh, most fire department personnel end up with this level of training. You can be a hazardous material specialist. That would be your hazmat team members, uh, sometimes called glow worms because they like to play with the bad stuff. Uh, this can also be people that work at a facility that has a specific hazard, like a, uh, a processing plant that has uh, hydrofluoric acid. And then you also have on-scene incident commander training. You can get incident command training through FEMA on their independent study website, you can take ICS 100, ICS 200, and ICS 700. These are all online classes available for free. If you want to get further into the incident management team process, you can take the incident management uh, 300 class, and then more technical is the 400 class. Those are both in-person classes available through many sources. Uh, in our local area, it's the Homeland Security Group that does those. So know what your resources are and to get the training if you want to move up. In those. First thing we have to do is identify that there is a potential hazardous material incident. So we have trucking companies, we have terminals, uh, chemical plants, places where chemicals are used, stored, delivery, agricultural, garden centers, railway, laboratories. In our area, we have five trucks with sodium cyanide driving down the interstate and then going up to the mines in Cripple Creek. That's five trucks a day. Uh, just within the last two weeks, one of those trucks had a crash on the side of the road uh, and did not spill any of the chemical, but it created quite a disturbance up there in uh, the mountain areas. If you have patients in a scene like that, everybody's considered contaminated until we can prove that they're clean. So what you want to do when you get there is establish the safe areas to be. We have the hot zone. This is where the bad stuff is. Uh, we look for victims. We look for dying plants. We look for anything that's going to tell us there's bad stuff there. In the warm zone, this is outside of the hot zone, so it's still relatively safe, but this is our decontamination corridor. This is where we clean the people up as they come out of that, in, that area, whether they're victims or responders that are going in. Once we are, fit, are comfortable that we're not in any danger anymore, that becomes the cold zone. That's where you stage all your equipment. That's where you have your treatment areas. So we have hot zone, warm zone, and cold zone. You need to try to figure out what the substance is. We can do that through uh, various t methods. We can look at the, the placards. We can talk to facility uh, managers, employees, and then try to figure out what to do with it. If it's an uh, outside environment, you can use binoculars, look for signs, labels, placards. Do not go up close to the, the location to look. Use your binoculars. Uh, look for labeling, check invoices, bills of lading, uh, shipping manifests. 
there's an app you can put on your phone from uh, BNSF, Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Uh, you can get the number off the car, and it will tell you what the con car contains, where it's going, and where it's coming from. Like uh, CSUX, CSUX, and then the number would say that it's a car that co contains coal and is going to Colorado Springs Utilities. Get the SDSs. If it's a uh, fixed facility, they will have the safety data sheets. Talk to the uh, workers that are coming out after they've been deconned. They can tell you what maybe uh, potential hazards there are. Then we use the uh, emergency response guidebook as our uh, initial source of information, or we can call Chemtrek. It's an 800 number that you should have programmed into your phone if you're working on the streets all the time. Uh, that way you have a, a direct line to access. Chemtel is the other option there. In our area, we have chemical experts at our uh, at the fire departments. We have uh, hazmat teams at a couple of fire departments here. We also have the civilian support team as part of the Air National Guard for the Colorado National Guard. That's out of the Denver area. Uh, we have pre, uh, regional poison control centers that 1-800-222-1222. Know the, uh, get as much information you can pass on to these resources. Let them know what you've got, uh, what the scene looks like, the callback information, container, conditions, location, quantity, any injuries, any exposures, uh, anything you can get, document that and provide that to the responders coming in to take care of the problem. Here's what the emergency response guidebook looks like you should have one of these in every vehicle along with a set of binoculars so you can get the placard information and then look up the basic initial response information this gives you what you need to know for the first five ten minutes of any disaster once you uh, get your zones established you're going to have rehab set up in the cold zone this is for all your responders they're going in and out of the hot zone. If you ever had a hazmat suit on with a full self-contained breathing apparatus underneath, you've got about 15, 20 minutes of functional use while you're in that hot zone. It's a fully enclosed environment, so you get hot, you get cold, depending on what uh, the environment is around you. Uh, when you set up your rehab area, it needs to be out of the weather. Get some type of tent or a trailer or something that you can protect your responders. Uh, everybody should be checked when they come out to make sure they're easy, to, uh, that they're they're healthy. Have good access. Establish a corridor for your EMS crews go in and out so that you can have uh, protection. Uh, get them off the scene as quick as possible. Do not park a running ambulance or vehicle at all next to the rehab area. It's a little problem called carbon monoxide poisoning. We don't want to create that for you. Uh, care of injured and contaminated. We decon in the warm zone. That are, those are trained professionals that go, will take care of the problem for us. And then we do our treatment in the cold zone. Once we feel decon, we have a pretty good uh, comfort level that they've been decontaminated, but they're still going to decontaminate them another time at the hospital. So you're going to need to wear your PPE as we go. Try to keep your vehicles as clean as possible. We don't want to contaminate them. Uh, use con disposable equipment. Uh, the other thing to remember is our firefighters, even though they have their invincible fire suits on, they are not invincible to hazardous materials. They need to have the specialized enclosed encapsulated suits that give them full protection. If they have their air packs on, that at least gives them protection from their airways, but the other skin can be contaminated, so they have to be deconned too. Four types of patients we're going to have. <laughs> Uninjured and not contaminated. They were not in the area to get exposed, and they're not hurt. They can go off to the side, and we can wait till we need to deal with them. You can have the injured but not contaminated. So maybe they got injured uh, away from the area. You have uninjured but contaminated. They can go through a decon process. And then you have the injured and contaminated. 
so they're going to have to be deconned and treated. Take all the precautions that they detail in your emergency response guidebook. They list first aid measures based on the chemicals or the class of the chemicals. And basically, it's ensure ABCs are taken care of. So make sure you have the critical needs of your patients done. Water dilutes the substances. It doesn't neutralize them, so you need lots of water. Uh, some of your hazmat teams carry neutralizing agents. They will be trained on how to use those. Most of our teams in the area have advanced hazmat life support or toxmetics. They will provide that treatment. And uh, then the other thing is, if you get exposed, you're going through decon too. Uh, decon is a 23-step process where they scrub you from head to toe, remove all your clothing, and scrub you gently with nice ice cold water, Tide detergent, the powdered kind, and a toilet brush. So it's nice and smooth loofah, and it rips up your skin. So uh, be prepared. Phases of decon, like I said, 23 steps. You got the gross decon. That is going to wash you when you first come out. Then you start taking your PPE off, and they wash you again as each layer of PPE comes off. Uh, lots of water, lots of soap, and it's always cold. We don't want your pores opening up. Once you get through that process, they will probably put you into a decon trailer or a tent process where we can do some fine detailing and uh, get all your cracks and crevices, get everything uh, cleaned off of you. Ways we can get rid of the uh, chemical on you, emulsification, making it uh, solid or liquid, chemical reaction, they find something to counteract the chemical. If it's a biologic or something that's a pathogen, you can disinfect. Dilution is the solution to most of our pollution. Uh, then we do absorption, adsorption, wipe them off over the paper towel and throw the paper towels into the contaminated area. Uh, removal of the chemical or just plain disposal. So the objectives of decon. You want to make sure everybody's in the right PPE. They need to be at least one level behind whoever goes in entry. So you know uh, everybody in level A or going into entry has to be level B or level A. At least they have to be level B when they come out in the decon area. So wear your PPE. You need a safety person to monitor accountability. And you need to monitor how long these people are exposed to the different toxins. Some of your more advanced teams have monitoring systems that they uh, attach probes to your, vic your uh, responders. And we can monitor their heart rates, check and see if they're doing okay, their body temperatures. Set up your decon. Patients that are critical go through decon first. We set up little rollers so we can put them on a backboard and roll them through and clean them top and bottom and get them to treatment as quick as possible. If you have patients that are contaminated, you have to do P triage and PPE and be able to communicate. So it makes it a little bit more difficult because you've got air, air uh, respiratory protection on. Buckets, some nice uh, hard brushes, decontamination solution, and tubs. Those cute little uh, swimming pools they sell in front of the stores every year that uh, you can maybe set one adult down in. Those are what we use for contamination. A dedicated water supply. We usually have big red trucks that have plenty of water on them, but we can also bring in other resources there. Tarps, plastic sheeting, something to contain the runoff. Remember what we dilute off the patients or off the victims just goes into the wastewater and so we need to contain that so it doesn't run off down into the creek. A-frame ladders, if you ever try to take your boots off without sitting down, you got to be talented. So we're going to give them A-frame ladders so they can uh, sit down while they're taking their PPE off. Also, we also need ladders for those that are short and can't reach the top of some of your pay, uh, responders as they come out so you can get them all cleaned. Rinse at the or process for decontaminating. You're going to rinse 
starting at the head and work your way down. So that's just a shower. Uh, they make some fancy showers, but a hose and a, a nozzle on it works. Scrub them down. Full in full, they're in full PPE, and then start helping them remove the PPE, making sure you contain the runoff. Decontam for decontamination from patients who weren't wearing any PPE. Your safety is number one, so make sure you're in the appropriate PPE. Get all the ambulatory people to come to the decon line, strip them down, including contact lenses. A lot of your chemicals are water soluble. They will absorb into the contacts, so you need to get the contacts out so they don't burn their eyes. As you take their clothing off, you're going to secure it, double bag it, and then it's going to have to go through its own decon process. And then consider modesty. If you're predicting live, that's no big deal, but try to use a little uh, concern as you go through. We do have a decon trailer, actually two of them here in our area, and they have two sides because we only planned for two genders male and female uh, but you can send one person through at a time if you're not sure all right let's talk about multiple casualty incidents a multiple casualty incident is more patients than your resources can handle so we may have a multiple casualty incident in tri-county fire area that is six patients because they only have two ambulances in that area. You could have a multiple casualty pay, uh, incident like the Las Vegas uh, uh, Country Music Festival shooting where you have multiple, uh, several hundred patients. So it all depends on your resources and your management process. Every, re every uh, area is required to have a local disaster plan. You can find these online. You can f check for your local emergency management office or your local uh, emergency preparedness committee, LEPC. They're written. Uh, they have plans for about every disaster. Uh, Colorado even has a disaster plan for space junk uh, that's on their state website under the local their emergency management group. They're realistic. They're rehearsed. They do exercises all, a lot. We use a system called the National Incident Management System to manage our disasters. The fire departments and EMS typically use this on a daily basis and one a very limited form. You have to have one person in charge. Uh, this could be actually one one point of being in charge. It could be a single person, could be the incident commander. Or we can have a unified command where you have maybe somebody from the fire department and somebody from the local utility company working together as a command structure. Underneath that, you have the FLOP. This is your general, uh, general staff. It's the finance, logistics, operations, and planning. People that make sure we have the money, people that make sure we have the stuff. Operations is where we actually do things, so that would be where EMS falls. And then the planning. They are making the plans for the future and documenting what you do now. Uh, underneath the commander, he has four officers, so these are command staff. You have a safety officer, a public information officer, liaison officer, and intelligence officer. Highly recommend you take those instant command courses, the self-study courses from FEMA, ICS 100, 200, and 700, and learn about these different things and learn how you function within those. Command functions, usually the most senior person. It can be, or it, it sometimes it's not. It depends on who's most qualified for the incident. Um, you can pass off command when somebody more trained arrives. I stopped at a scene one time and started making some command decisions. And when the fire chief showed up, he's like, you're doing a great job. Keep going. And left me in command for several fire companies. Once we got finished, I figured out real quickly why he left me in command when he pointed me in the direction of where all the paperwork needed to be done. So he let me do all the paperwork that goes with being the instant command. 
So be aware of what you can and can't do is this this job, but we need to have one person in charge. Whoever gets to the scene first needs to do a complete size up. In the fire service, that's called a 360 degree size up. You take a complete lap of your scene. Now, if it's a big scene, it may take a little while to get done, but you need to understand what you're getting yourself into and understand what resources. This is the scene size up. It's the same thing we talk about on everyday events, but just a bigger option. So do a quick walk around, figure out what resources you're going to need, and then a good size up on the radio to all additional resources coming in. Give a brief report, give them a size up, ask for more resources. If you can do face to face, one thing we do at our scenes here in our local community is whoever is in command will have a a green light on their vehicle. You see the flashing green light and that's where you go if you need to talk to command. Uh, once we get a command established, that is the point of contact for anybody on the outside of that, that scene. So they're the ones that call dispatch. They're the ones that are allowed talking to media. Now they may delegate that to their officers or their general staff. So maybe they have logistics called dispatch when they need something. But the command is in control and let them have that authority. Make sure you organize soon and quickly. Um, Make sure you have all the pieces in place. Have a plan to deploy resources. Know what you're planning to do with your resources. One thing we do on larger events is we're planning the next operational period. We figure out what our objectives are and how many resources we're going to need, and then you start negotiating with logistics on how much, re how much each area for their objectives need, and you divide the resource up based on priority. So think big, get as much resources there as you can. Think about supply and staging areas. The three things for any large event that you have to have right off the bat, food, water, and porta potties. Those were the standard things I would order for logistics anytime I had a large event. Make sure they were fed and they had water. And then once you put the stuff in, you got to have a way to, for it to come out. So uh, the other thing we need to do is prevent freelancing so everybody knows we're on the same page. You don't want somebody going in the back door when you're trying to go in the front door with uh, water or any other possible problems. Uh, most good uh, incident commanders that are they plan on being in that position carry some type of tactical worksheet. I carry those with me so that I can set up command structure anytime I need to. Scene management, most senior person follow, uh, assumes command. They take the responsibility for all medical aspects and safety of all personnel. As soon as you can, you set up a safety person for your job. Underneath that safety, you have the plan to make execute safety and then you have the response if anything doesn't go right. They will set up a medical support group under that, but specifically for responder medical issues. It's not for the, like the EMS. This is just strictly, if something happens, what do we do? You designate area supervisors. We can designate supervisors based on geography or task. You can have an EMS supervisor, or you can have the north group and the south group. Uh, you need to work together. Some scenes may start out as a fire, but as soon as you find out there was a, a criminal element, it becomes a police scene. So you're going to have to work together with the law enforcement and EMS and police and utilities. Uh, you want to keep the uninjured from beginning being injured, so you're going to keep bystanders away as much as possible. Another thing about MCI is mass casualty incidents is a psychological first aid. It's a course you can take. Uh, it's available in many different formats, but it's um, just kind of how to may help people get to where they need to be in a mass casualty. So you need to be uh, 
empathetic and try to make sure that they're calm about what's going on. And then you have to recognize your other responders and make sure they are handling things. My, uh, the, the guy that was my preceptor in paramedic school, his son was taking the EMT class in 2011, graduated on a Saturday, completed his practical exam. Sunday, they had an EF5 tornado go through our hometown. And he took his son with him to set up to help with the response. So he's 18 year old, completed EMT class. On Saturday, Sunday, he is put in charge of triaging 500 patients with multiple fatalities. So just think about the emotional uh, response to some something like that. That's why we need to be uh, aware of our psychological first aid and how to help our fellow responders. Once you set up the EMS branch, you're going to divide that out. You can put extrication under EMS or you can put it under um, fire. Depends on how your system's set up. Same with staging area. You may have a separate staging area or you may have a combined staging area for all resources. Talk to the guy that set up the staging area for Virginia Tech for the shooting. He used the local Walmart as his staging area. Provided a nice, large parking lot, well lit, and as soon as you start staging resources there, Walmart picks up on the fact that you're using their parking lot, and they're very generous. They bring out water, they allow you to use their restrooms, uh, they bring things to uh, make, your, make it more comfortable for you there while you're waiting for your assignment. What we want to do is have all those extra resources available at a moment's notice close by so we can get them into the, the response area. You're going to have a triage area where you're bringing all your patients uh, to get triaged or you're doing triage on seeing and bringing them back to the treatment area. Treatment is where you provide treatment, uh, medical treatment, until you can transport. Transport is a corridor where you can drive ambulances in and pick up patients and leave the patient and leave to go to the hospital. And then as we talked about hazmat, you need a rehab area. You're going to set up somebody in charge of each one of these groups just to make sure that uh, we're being taken care of correctly and make sure that there's somebody that's responsible and can understand what their role in the, uh, the response is. Triage is the, the goal is to afford the greatest number of people the greatest chance of survival. Or more succinctly, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one. You need to be aware of the triage. Uh, um, and this is a very hot topic. There is a supplemental video in Modular 6 Supplemental that has a lecture by... Uh, it's on the the ramp triage system by Brad Keating. He does a really good job of explaining why we need to use a simple triage system because this is a once in a lifetime response. It's not something you do every day. And I will disagree with our textbook and say it's not the supervisor that should be in charge of triage. It should be the newest person that maybe had the class more recently and that is scared to death and that will do the triage as quick as possible. Our goal is to get these people off the scene so they can we can save their lives, not to stay around and play with a triage system that uh, doesn't help the patient. So when we're triaging patients, we're going to have three prior, four priorities. Um, treatable, life-threatening injuries and illnesses. These are the people that, if we get them off scene quickly, are going to survive. Priority two, uh, they're serious but not life-threatening illnesses or injuries. Walking wounded, priority three. These are the people that aren't really hurt but can, uh, probably need to go get checked. And then priority four or priority zero, the dead or fatally injured. The ones that are, don't know they're dead yet or they are really already dead. One system we use uh, fairly consistently across the United States is the START triage, simple triage and rapid treatment. 
Uh, it's made to do uh, as much as we can to figure out what's wrong with our patients and prioritize them in the four categories there. When we get revved up, we use RPMs, respiration, pulse, and mental status. So we're going to try to work our way through this process and determine who's our high priority patients and have the best chance of survival if we get them off scene as quick as possible. Start off with, are they able to walk? So you walk into a scene and say, anybody that can hear my voice, walk towards the light, come towards me and sit here on the curb. These are my priority threes or my uh, walking wounded. If they can't walk, first thing we're going to do is, are they breathing? If they're not breathing, then we open their airway. And if they start breathing, we give them a, a priority one and move on. So we open airways and drop an OPA or NPA. We can stop bleeding. We treat life threats, basically. Uh, we can move uh, extremities lift the extremities so we can get some perfusion better. But basically, it's, it's open the airway, stop the bleeding, and move on. When we assess respirations, if they're greater than 30, they get a priority one or a red tag. If they're less than 30, then we move to the next check, the pulse. How long does it take to count respirations doing 30 times a minute? Two seconds. If they breathe, count to two, they breathe again, they're greater than 30. If they have no airway, open the airway. If they start breathing, they're a red tag or priority one. If they don't start breathing, we priority four or red, black tag them. When we go to the pulse, if they have no pulse, they're not breathing, they're unresponsive, they, are no, they have no chance of survival, so we black tag them. If they're breathing but no radial pulse, they're a high priority, priority one, red. If they're breathing, pulse, good skin, and cap refill, then we move on to the next one, their mental status. If they are alert and oriented, they get a two. If they are not, they get a one. So altered mental status is one of the big killers on mass casualties. Now go back to your walking woundeds and check them again. Make sure no one tried to fool you. So now you've got everybody tagged. Red, yellow, green, and black. So with that, you're going to have your litter bearers going behind the triage person, picking up all the reds, and taking them to the treatment area. Your transport officer will work with the treatment officer to, to pick the highest priority reds and get those into the ambulance to go. Another system we have is the SALT, Sort, Assess, Life-Threatening Interventions, Treatment, and Transport. This is one that is authorized in Colorado, but very rarely used. I'm not familiar with anybody in our state that uses it uh, other than for education purposes. So immediates are your life threats, very similar to what we had uh, with the start triage, yellow or delayed, these are serious but uh, didn't quite make the category for the, the red tag. And then greens are the minor injuries, black or dead. Uh, either they're dead or they're dying and have uh, non injuries non-compatible with life. They also throw in the gray categories. These are the ones that are injuries compatible to life. This is why we don't use this one very much because it is a little confusing. It changes back and forth. Once you get them into the casualty collection point or treatment area, we're going to re-triage them, making sure that we know which ones need to go to the hospital. This is something that uh, their treatment or your transport officer is going to be worried about. You're going to try to get as many people into each ambulance as possible. So basically, when you get to the scene, you're going to take your cot, pull it out of the ambulance, and park it next to the, the side of the highway, wherever you are. That way, now you have floor space for three more patients and one on the bench seat. 
So you've got plenty of space to put in, pay, patients in. You don't do treatment on the way to the hospital. You get to the hospital, you open the back door, and if the hospital's triage or the mass casualty system set up right, they will pull your patients out. You'll stand in the back, you'll shut the door, and you'll leave. There will be no conversation. They get four patients, they figure out what's wrong with them. They're going to re-triage them anyway, so now they, you just go back to the scene and get four more. So we use a system called EM Systems, which will alert hospitals to a disaster. They input how many resources they have available, and then that goes to the treatment or the transport officer, and they can send patients based on the availability of each hospital. They will track which hospital you're going to. A uh, so, uh, way I saw that worked really good was to keep a, uh, a grease pencil with the transport officer's paperwork, and they'll put a number and the hospital on the side of the ambulance so they don't, so they know who's going where. So they'll take the, like, the driver's side door and write 3 Memorial Central or whatever hospitals you're going to. You do not talk to the hospital. You don't give them radio reports. You don't do anything other than drive there, drop your patients off, and come back and get more. So this is uh, making sure you're communicating with hospitals. That's that EM system. You do not call. Uh, the other thing that they've found interesting is most patients get off scene way before EMS gets there. Uh, some history from di uh, previous disasters. So what we want to do is have that good communication and find out what hospitals these patients have gone to by private vehicle, Uber, Lyft, police car, and make sure we don't overload those hospitals. So I highly recommend you look at the ramp uh, video kind of understand where he's coming from it's a much easier system but unfortunately for now the national registry hasn't caught up and the start triage is the one that you're tested on so that's why we wanted to go over it but ramp is something that uh, you may see in the very near future a lot of systems are starting to use it thank you for taking the time to watch this video hopefully it helps you on your journey to become an EMT Please like and subscribe, and let me know in the comments how you're doing on your class and if you have any questions. Thanks, and have a great day.